Hello, uh, my name is Finaš Svatoš, and I work in the Národní filmový archiv in Prague on digitizing and long term presentation of our visual heritage in Czech lands. Uh, this short overview uh, will be about leveraging the concept of so-called object storage model towards easier access to audiovisual data, mainly with respect to parallelization and data safety. What motivation is there behind actually pursuing a completely different way how to work with files? Well, traditional file systems tend not to scale well for audiovisual purposes. The storage subsystem is either large and slow or small and fast, right? Trying to overcome this, usually the clustered so storage solutions in digital preservation are based around SEN-like model, where there's a clear physical path between client and the server, usually iSCSI or fiber channel connections. This is complicated from an infrastructure point of view and tend to be a bit pricey as well. You get to choose between two ends, data redundancy and performance. What do you choose? Last but not least, the traditional file system access was not invented with microservices in mind, and the whole mesh, service mesh concept, and uh, the whole service mesh concept, does the implementation to these systems is usually non-trivial. So, what's an object storage anyway? It's a storage service from which data is uh, retrieved on a per object basis. One can look at object like a small archival package where not only data, but also arbitrary metadata is present. This, dif this differs from a file system where every file has only a fixed set of parameters defined by the file system itself. Therefore, object storage is a bit like a database for files from where you read and write them via web APIs, mostly REST or uh, SOAP API. Any program capable of HTTP communication is therefore able to access them directly, supposing it has the uh, right credentials. On object storage, one can have multiple root folders, so-called buckets, for principal content differ differentiation. Speaking of folders, physically there are none, they are present only in the form of metadata to emulate the traditional file folder-based paradigm. Um, something about security. Uh, the barrier between, between data resi residing someplace and an application residing elsewhere then becomes only a matter of access control rather than how to make data accessible. To properly access the data, we must provide a secret uh, most usually two variables resembling username and password in a every HTTP request. This requires an effort uh, on the developer side to properly safeguard those secrets, supposing the object storage is publicly accessible. Even though there are many implementations of object storage model, they all share the same system and in majority also in the API. The API is called S3. It's a shortcut for super simple storage, which is a de facto standard due to the fact that the original implementation of Amazon's hosted product, called, also called S3, has become an industry standard not long after its adoption. Fortunately, they are not just proprietarily hosted, so-called cloud-based solutions, but open source implementations <coughs> exist which anybody can run on their own they differ in robustness, scalability, and complexity. In Narodní filmy archive, we implemented one of them called MinIO. So what's MinIO? It's an S3 storage server built with simplicity in mind. It follows do one thing and do it well, Unix philosophy, given the fact that it's written in the Go language, uh, which was or, uh, originally co-invented by, by one of the Unix pioneers, which the source code compiles into one sole binary. S3 servers try to remove the burden of working with shard files by splitting them into several pieces and working with them in parallel, and MinIO is no exception. This enables multi-gigabyte read and write speeds on spinning disks, as the chunks are split between the underlying disks, multiplying the performance. To take it even further, 
it employs erasure coding algorithm uh, to ensure data is duplicated for redundancy and corrupt chunks are replaced on the fly. MinIO can run both in standalone mode on a physical server, say with uh, JBot drive with 60 disks, or in cluster mode with hundreds of containers, with uh, everyone with, with, each, with its own data storage. As for fixity, S3 API has mandatory fixity requirements, which enforces checksums, checksum calculation during data ingest, and its retention during the life of the object. When chunking is used, Hashes are calculated in parallel, and those are then hashed together, calculating something like a called a hash of the hashes. You can see it in the image. And as for the number after the dash, this is actually a number of chunks. So you can divide the number of chunks, uh, the file size by the number of chunks, and you get back the, the size of the chunk. Uh, S3 specs uses MD5 function, which is slightly outdated these days, as the API is stable since 2006. But it's better than nothing, or not, no hash at all. The resulting checksum is directly available to the application, and is present in every HTTP response from the S3 API to detect any changes made to the data. And there's also a tool called S3MD5, which can be used to verify the affixity of local copy of the data against the API. Uh, Minio is able to hold the data in several locations for redundancy. So there's no need for proprietary write anymore, rate anymore, as the function is superseded by the erasure code algorithms. When starting the server, one has to specify a list of directories where Minio should make the storage. It is expected that those will be empty drive mounts, but those can be any directories as well. The redundancy ratio is configur configurable, but the default is configured in a way that even half of the drives, if half of the drives are gone, the data can still be accessed. Write access needs majority of the drives, though. MinIO's erasure code coding is based on the very fast algorithm called Highway Hash, which is able to hash multiple gigabytes uh, per second on a single CPU core, so it's pretty fast. When the system detects an error, one of the chunks will be automatically constructed from the other parts present in the system, be it bitrot or a crashed disk, which, will, which was just replaced. Uh, MinIO Min has also the ability to enforce a global warm mode, so-called, uh, which stands for write once, read many, which means the storage provides only read and write APIs, nothing else. So no data can be lost even if the user or the applications would want it to. This further enforces data retention, as no application is able to modify the data after it has been ingested. When working with AV material directly, like playing it or post-production workflows, API access is not yet feasible because the application don't support it simply. Luckily, S3 API has several wrapper implementations. For example, FUSE, File System and User Space driver, which enables us to work with object storage buckets like with any other file system. This mode of access retains the benefits of parallelization so multiple uh, chunks in read or write mode, but must be carefully used, especially in operation uh, where frequent or parallel metadata access is used, which can be a problem due to the fact that metadata retrieval is relatively expensive on S3 compared to data access. One good example is a folder full of DPX files which I wouldn't recommend you to store on object storage. Rather compress it with raw cooked. As for tools, every data storage needs uh, some tools to do housekeeping tasks, like listing a directory, creating, deleting, without actually working with it. And object storage is no except, ex exception. MinIO itself has two clients, 
a web UI which is available by default and it's part of the binary and also a command line uh, application called MC. Don't know why they call it an MC. Maybe Minio C would be better because MC is also a midnight commander. So, yeah. The tool tries to emulate uh, standard POSIX commands like copy, move, find, etc. But there are several other client applications <coughs> like SC CMD, which is also command line based. And for GUI lovers, there's always uh, CyberDuck, which is almighty to all the uh, cloud services and FTPs and so So this concludes my quick overview and here are just some links for your studying pleasure. Thank you. And I would be welcome for any questions. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this. Uh, actually, I just have to, uh, I've just been involved in a project where he starts off on an S3 Ceph implementation. Yeah. And have, are there any uh, concerns about the fuse um, mount performance wise in your experience? Because I have not found this, to be honest. Well, um, we're not using it for uh, writing yeah. because I would not probably recommend using fuse Ceph file system for. Writing to anything. No, 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 not for writing, just, just, just reading because they had to implement all the code that you would just have access file system, like all the routines that iterate through files. Yeah. You have to implement it unless you mount it, right? That's right, yes. Um, okay, then, then I didn't have a look this. And just one thing, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm flirting we with can, Jerome right now on, on about S3 ways. patch to extract metadata on local mm -hmm. S3, so about the metadata extraction stuff. Okay. Other requests, Stephen. Hi, Stephen from BFI. Um, so thanks so much. That was a wonderful. I've been uh, considering a Ceph implementation, but found it too complex for my brain to get its hooks into. But uh, would you say that MinIO is a simpler solution than Ceph, or much of a muchness? Well, no, there's no differentiation between metadata server and the content server, and there is no fencer required because this is just either it's a standalone uh, server or it's in cluster mode, which means that they have to be at least three of them to, to have, uh, how to say it, um, that, so there will be a majority of the clusters in case of split brain. Can I ask two? I know that's terrible etiquette, but. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I should pick your brains after for sure. <laughs> of but, course. Um, so most of your users, day-to-day -day users, do they use the web GUI or do they use CyberDoc or how do they move their, their files in and out? Actually, we don't use the web UI at all. Mm -hmm. We use it only through external applications. Mm -hmm. So it, all, it only sits uh, as an API on mm -hmm. the web service. So the web UI is really simple. There's no, not much you can do, but mm -hmm. it, it is there. So you can access it through web, web if you don't have any other application that can work with S3 API. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Other questions? Remote questions? No? Okay, one more. <laughs> Sorry, me again. Uh, you said it's, uh, it has, uses MD5 as a hash. But yes. then you had the e tag in the metadata blob. Oh, well, it's only a naming uh, issue. I, I, I really don't know why they call it e tag. Did you verify this? Because in my research, yes. it was like it was not MD5. It's something like the Ceph S3 that I have to deal with. It was not MD5. Well, as for S33 specs, it's, it's really an MD5 algorithm. Okay, because but the thing is that uh, the hash you get from the service is yeah. the sum of all the hashes of all the of chunks. The, of the chunks, you know, and you need, yeah. to need to know the chunk size to yes. recalculate yes. this. And if there are multiple chunks, yeah. the e tag, so called e tag, has a yeah. dash in it, and then the number after the dash is the number of chunks. So, therefore, you've got the size of the whole object, and then you've got a number of chunks. So, you can divide the file size by the number of chunks, and you get the uh, si uh, chunk size. Okay, that, and I was yeah. referring to the uh, S3 MD5 
uh -huh, script, uh -huh. let's say. It's a Python script, I think, which can automate, automate this. But you can do it also manually by hand. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jonas. <laughs>